grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Come, you who hunger for food, worship the Lord who turns wants into plenty. Come, you who hunger for justice, worship the Lord who turns weeping into laughter. Come, you who hunger for life, worship the Lord who is our hope and our strength. Good morning. The promise of our faith is this. For all who call out in truth, God is near. Therefore, let us confess our sins first together and then silently. O oh Christ, when the crowds surrounded you, hungry for bread and for your word, you took an offering, five loaves, two fish. 
and made for them a feast. Still, O Lord, we doubt the abundance of your grace. Still, O Lord, we are hesitant to share the gifts we all have. Still, O Lord, we wonder whether there's enough for all. Forgive us, O God, and make us a more generous people. Empower us to share the gifts of our lives and enlighten us to see the miracles around us. For you are the giver of grace upon grace, the one who turns want into plenty. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer and forgive us. God is gracious, merciful, abounding in steadfast love, and gives us forgiveness and grace. We do not have to earn it, but rather accept it in love. Friends, believe the new good news of the gospel. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You're invited to share words and signs of greeting and reconciliation. Peace. Good morning. This morning in our time with young disciples, I want to talk about playdates. I want to talk about playing with our friends, getting together, having a friend over, meeting at a park. We get to call on the phone and say, hi there, would you like to come over? My mom said it was okay, can you ask your mom? And then the other person calls back in a few minutes and says, yeah, she said it was okay. And you're so excited. You want to see your friend. You want to get things ready. You want it to be just right. And so your friend arrives. You're so excited you can hardly stand it. You want to get right away to playing. And so you do. Well then, it's time to go home. You've had so much fun. You've done all the things that you love. You've had snacks that you both really enjoy because they're your really good friend and you know what they like. So of course you have it. But you don't want to go home. So you ask your mom, is it okay if they stay for dinner? Right? And so then they have to call their mom and say, hey mom, is it okay if we stay for dinner? Okay, yes, it's fine. And you get to share a meal. At that point, you're not just sitting there with your friend anymore. You're sitting there with their parents, their family, their aunt, their uncle, their siblings. You're sitting around a table with people that you don't really know as well as you know your friend. And maybe it's a little uncomfortable, but at the same time, you're still there with your friend, and it's so great because you didn't have to go home earlier. God is that way. 
God gets excited every day when we wake up. God makes sure that we have what we need and that we have friends that we can call. God makes sure we have a place around the table. God wants our family here to do the same thing. So this week, when you're talking to your friends, whether you're going out to eat, whether you go for a play date at the park or have someone over, think to yourself, do they know that they have a place around the table? Do they know that they have a place to call home? The invitation's already there. They don't even have to call their moms to say, hey, is it okay if I go sit around God's table with my friend? Mom can come too. Let's pray. Loving God, you have made a place for all of us and call us beloved just like we are. God, help us to invite our friends, our family, to your table as well. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to welcome you all to worship here at Northwest Presbyterian Church. Whether you have found us here in person or you are with us online, we are so glad that you're here. I do want to let you all know about the passing of Mary Jean Robertson. We were so sad to learn that this week. We do not yet have funeral arrangements, but as soon as we do, we will let you all know. Let us pray. Almighty God of all creation, we join our voices to praise you today, singing of your wonders, giving thanks for your grace and care, and celebrating the joys of life you have blessed us with, family and friends, new relationships and deeper relationships, new life and transformed lives, reconciliation and restoration. Merciful God, we know that you hear the prayers of our hearts and even discern the prayers found in the paths of our tears. We ask that you be with those who are hurting today. And yes, God, today, even on the Sabbath, we ask that you would heal those whose bodies, hearts, minds, and relationships are in need of your touch. God, restore them to life, to peace, to joyful living in the ways that only you can. Gracious God, all of our prayers are summed up in the longing for your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So we join our voices together, God, praying for the coming of your kingdom, using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God freely gives and we freely receive. From those gifts, let us return a portion of God's work in the world.
let us pray. Loving God, we offer to you only a portion of what you have given us. All that we have is from your creative hand. All that we can give away, we do through Jesus' love. All our renewal comes from the Holy Spirit's wisdom. Please multiply our gifts that others may have joy and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both you, both of you, may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then, in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Our second reading, which is not listed in the bulletin, comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 through 15, and then jumping to verse 40. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to, ne to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for many days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you have judged me to be, a, to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home. 
And when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, by your Spirit, reveal your radical, surprising love. Come to us through your word this morning and open our ears and our hearts to hear what you are saying. Amen. So this morning, I want to start out with us thinking about something together. I want to invite you to think back to a time where you were visiting somewhere and you were completely welcome. A place where you had been invited. They knew you were coming. Where your presence was eagerly anticipated. A time when someone knew your favorite things and had gone out of their way to make sure to have them there for you. They made sure that you knew you were welcome. But even more than that, you knew that they had been waiting for you. You were exactly what they had been waiting for. Just by being there, you brought them joy. Can you think of that place? That person? Can you remember the look in their eyes when they saw you and realized you had finally arrived? They know you, really, just as you are. And they're just as comfortable with you. Hospitality, real hospitality, authenticity like that, those two things help create an environment where people can really see and show their true selves. Well, in our reading this morning from Acts, we hear about a trip that Paul and the apostles Silas and Timothy and their companions are making. They're traveling through Asia Minor to Europe, stopping briefly in Philippi, part of modern-day Greece. Since there may not have been an established synagogue in Philippi, on the Sabbath day they find a house of prayer by the river. It's a space not filled with men and priests, but with women. They were welcomed, and they decided to join them. And as Paul speaks, one woman in particular, Lydia of Thyatira, a Gentile woman devoted to Jewish worship, a dealer of purple cloth, listens intently. Her heart expands with every word she hears. And despite her foreigner status and how women are typically regarded in scripture, Lydia is a woman of power, of influence, She's a woman with dignity. Purple dye was a luxury item for the elite, so it's pretty safe for us to say that she was an established businesswoman. She's also, surprisingly, the head of her household. And after being stirred by Paul's message, we're told that she and her household are baptized. 
No patriarch is named. No man gives credit or permission for this. And Paul doesn't bat an eye. In Lydia's first act as a newly baptized disciple of Christ is hospitality. She eagerly welcomes the apostles into her home. And later, after Paul and Silas are released from prison, her large home becomes a meeting place for the apostles and the growing Christian community in Philippi. Lydia is the only Philippian convert named in the book of Acts. She's believed to be the leader and patron of the Philippian church. She used her wealth to establish the community. She risked her reputation as a businesswoman to house foreigners released from prison. She sanctified her conversion with acts of radical hospitality. Her hospitality widened the reach of the gospel and helped sustain the ministry of the apostles. Her hospitality was known far and wide. We know about it today. But there's a lot of things we don't know about her. And I think if they had been important, they would have been included. I think everything we need to know about Lydia is apparent in the little bit that we're told in our scripture reading. So it makes me think back to Jesus' fellowship habits. When Jesus was walking around on the earth having a meal with someone was a pretty public act. If you were eating with someone outside of your family, the whole town knew. It usually symbolized an alliance among those who were eating. And so really, let's think about who Jesus was eating with. Jesus shared meals with the Pharisees and the people in power. He shared meals with the people that those people considered sinners. He shared meals with people that had no status at all, and I wonder how all those people felt when they ate with him. I wonder if he made those people in power feel like they were sitting at a less important table when they ate with him. I wonder if they felt his love and were comfortable being their authentic selves with him. And I wonder about those on the fringes of society that he ate with. I wonder if they felt like they had been invited to a higher table because he was someone who ate with important people. Did they feel comfortable being their true, authentic selves? Were they nervous? Were they putting on their best faces? I don't know. I find myself thinking that if Jesus were here walking on the earth today, that we would probably find him on the fringes of our society. We might find him in a homeless shelter or in a leper colony or an orphanage. But these passages remind me that it's probably just as true that Jesus would be found 
with the leaders of the world, too. So I wonder what it would look like for us to set a table like Jesus did. Who would we invite? How would we guide the conversation and handle the conflicts that we know will likely arise? Could we be our truest selves around that table? I said it once earlier, I think it bears repeating. Hospitality and authenticity create an environment in which everyone can see and show their own true selves. We talked a lot about compassion and curiosity earlier this summer. And when I think about the table that Jesus set, I think those were the key. Jesus was interested in the hearts and the lives of those around him. He cared deeply about their immediate physical needs, but also about their spiritual and emotional needs. He listened and responded from a place of love and compassion at every turn. But friends, that wasn't the norm when it came to life in Jesus' time. Maybe it isn't very different now. You see, authenticity, being vulnerable, can be a terrible liability. I know each of us can think of a time where we have engaged with people when we've revealed something about ourselves that we regretted later based on their reaction. I also know that there have been times each of us has revealed ourselves and found true acceptance and connection. Think back to that place that we started, that place of welcome that we were thinking about. Think about that person, that place, that love that was extended to you. Think about that feeling when you got that invitation, when you arrived, and the delight the other person took in simply in you being there. Friends, every morning when we wake up, God delights in us, just as we are. We've all received an invitation for a place to call home. And there's already a place set for us at the table. A place where our truest selves, beautiful and diverse, is not only welcome, but appreciated and celebrated. So our challenge this week is something that us Presbyterians really don't do that well. I want you to think about your friends. The people that you talk to through the week. Do they have a place to call home? Could you invite them? I wonder, how can we, as the church, show these newcomers, our friends that we will invite, really 
how can we show them that we need you? We've been waiting for you. We have a place already set. How can we show them that their authentic selves are exactly who we've been waiting for? Can we invite them to this place of welcome? Friends, we're invited to the table. We gather in this place. And there's plenty of God's love to go around. Amen. as you leave this place. May God grant you the curiosity to counter assumptions, the vulnerability to befriend, the bravery to speak your truth, the wisdom to listen, the strength to ask for help, the resiliency to choose love even when it's hard, and the awareness of the Holy Spirit always beside you. May the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.